So, welcome back to our last lecture of, on uh, dark energy. So, last time we were looking at Galileans um, as models that can potentially give you a kinetic screening. So, we'll see how that works uh, today. We'll introduce the Galileans last time. Let me just imagine now uh, for concreteness to have a particular model um, where we have a Lagrangian, which is the one of GR. Let's imagine, let me put the squared minus g in front, uh, in it as well. Okay. Squared minus g, and then we have uh, gr, and then we have, um, let me say, covariantized version um, uh, of the Galilean Lagrangian that I mentioned uh, uh, the other day. Let me not talk too much about how we covariantize them, but we'll have um, the second, etc., the cubic. Uh, Galileon, Galileon, and in principle we, ha we could have up to the quintic one of them. So we'll focus in the case where we have just L2 plus L3, where this is going to be square root minus g, because we're now going to want to work in uh, cursed space time for a second to see how that can lead to um, dark energy models. The L2 is simply the standard kinetic term for our scalar field. And then we had introduced a cubic Galileon, which we said was like so. In principle, you could um, include all of them if you wanted to, but let me just focus on that just for concreteness. That particular model has um, issues of its own, but um, that can be resolved if you introduce the other ones. I just want to, to be as simple as, po as possible uh, at, the, at this stage. And so we have introduced a scale, lambda, and we had some motivation yesterday that this uh, special type of Galilean operators, they satisfy at the level of the action. So if I were to put an integral in here, after performing some integration bypass, they satisfy um, the Galilean and shift uh, symmetry. And so we said that any quantum corrections generated uh, within this low energy effective field theory by at least loops of this um, on scalar field should only involve operators that directly generate the same uh, symmetry. And since these Galilean operators, they only do so after integration by parts, um, the coefficients of these Galilean operators cannot be renormalized, cannot be modified by quantum corrections. This statement will no longer be true if you take some generalization of the Galilean where you put an arbitrary function of phi in front or an arbitrary function of phi and derivatives of phi in front. Then you would lose the non-normalization theorem. You would lose the, the Galilean symmetry. So this satisfies, as we mentioned, the non-renormalization, which is a motivation for thinking that the scale lambda could potentially be quite small and not needing to worry just yet about quantum corrections. Um, so now we're going to look at how um, we can uh, have some dark energy solutions. And this is going to be very symbolic. You can do it exactly. Uh, particularly, I would suggest to include the other Galilean terms if you want to do it ex exactly, because it will uh, strongly help with the, uh, uh, the well-behavedness the, of the perturbations. But let me not do perturbations on top of that right now about this solution. Um, so we're going to want to look at FRW solutions, or even just the Sitter solutions. Um, for the, I'll start with the, the Sitter FRW, uh, sorry, mini super space approximation. just like we did in the very first uh, lecture. The mini super space approximation where I put myself in FRW. I'm gonna keep the lab so I can derive the Friedman equation with it and as soon as I derive the Friedman equation, I'm, I can uh, set it back up to one if I want to and then I have my three coordinates um, in there. So I have the labs uh, and the scale factor and my scalar field, I will say, is only a function of time. This is what it means to be in uh, the FRW uh, symmetry, and this is the mini super space approximation. We're only going to consider variation of the action with respect to the labs, uh, the scale factor if I wanted to, and the scalar field if I wanted to. So we already saw in the first lecture what uh, this term 
coming from the standard Einstein term is within that mini superspace approximation. And now we can put uh, this thing in. We know, of course, what that is. We'll have the d phi squared. In this case, will be uh, phi dot squared over n squared, the lapse um, that comes in. And a dot is um, the rate with respect to time, the time here. Uh, and we can uh, work out what the box is. A priori, I will need to involve some derivatives of the labs, some derivatives of the scale factor, second derivative of the, of the scalar field when I derive the box. But I can uh, perform integration by parts, and it is very much the virtue of these Galilean operators that even though it looks like it's uh, going to involve lots of derivatives, in particular derivatives of the labs, after integration by parts, all of those get removed, and we're going to be left with the labs generating the constraint, as it is the case in GR. It's very much the virtue of these operators. It's very much the virtue of the fact that they don't have any Ostrogatsky ghost, and the constraint remains there. So I'm just going to write you for you symbolically what we get in the, after integration by parts. We're going to have that the whole, yeah, let me do the whole action. So we know from this part here, what was it we had? Something like 6 m Planck squared over 2, and it should have been, what, a, a dot squared over n. I think you can check that uh, from the notes of the first lecture, but it should be roughly something like that. And then we're going to have from this term, we will have plus phi dot squared, we'll have an a cube in front, and then we'll have an n, maybe a factor of 2. And then from this thing here, just from scaling argument, we know that it will have to scale like 1 over lambda cube. It will need to have phi dot cube. After integration by parts, there's no um, phi dot a dot. And then one of the derivatives must be taken by an a dot. And so we'll need to have an a square in front. And then there's four derivatives here. Every derivative carries an inverse power of the lapse. And then there's one power of the lapse coming from the measure, the square root minus g. So it should be an n cube uh, coming in here. So that's roughly the scaling. Exactly what coefficient we have here is, uh, is a 2. It happens to be a 2. So that doesn't matter too much. Okay, and so now we can derive our Friedman equation. Which is again the constraint generated by the lapse, which is not dynamical as we see here. The variation with respect to the lapse gives us, from here we get the standard um, term from the Friedman left-hand side, which is familiar. It's going to have a 3 in here, where h at this stage is a dot over n a, but I'm going to set n is 1 once after having derived the equation of motion. From here, we're going to have is equal to a half phi dot squared. And this is the standard thing. So if we didn't have the cubic Galilean interaction, this would be a standard kinetic term, a standard uh, scalar field, and this is indeed the energy density that we have, uh, usually if it doesn't have a potential, right? It's just a, the contribution from that. But now there's a new contribution to the energy density coming from the Gubic Galilean term, and this will have to scale like uh, phi dot cube over lambda cube, and there should be an h in front, just to take care of the, the number of derivatives. Okay, so this is roughly the, uh, the uh, equation of, of motion. Now we can see that there is um, a solution, and we're just going to look at the scaling, and I'm going to go through the exact number, uh, an, exact, an exact solution where we have that phi dot, well, let me see, just phi, is equal to a constant, uh, and this constant should be, oh, well, let me just say, there should be a solution where, roughly speaking, all of these terms are of the same order of magnitude, so I can compare any two of them. For instance, I can compare this term, this term, and that term, for instance, and that tells me that phi dot 
h is of order lambda cube. And so that means that phi dot, there's a solution where phi is equal to lambda cube of, uh, let me say, a constant h zero times t. And then we'll, by plugging that back into here, we'll get that h squared is equal to, um, we'll have the m Planck squared in front here, and I put that back in here. That's going to give us lambda to the 6 over this h0. So h squared, let me say h is a constant equal to h0. If this is a constant, then this will be a constant, this will be a constant, and h will be a constant, so we'll be on the setter. And we'll have the h0 squared in there. Right. And so that gives us a solution where we have h0 squared is equal to, I have h to the 4, I'll take the square root, so it's h cubed over m Planck. Roughly, there's a numerical factor in here, okay? So depending, if we want to put that exactly to be that, then there'll be a numerical factor in there. So we need have a de Sitter solution. And we have the right order of magnitude for the amount of acceleration today if the scale lambda cube is of the order of h0 squared today times the Planck scale. So this in energy scale is roughly h0 is 10 to the minus 33 electron volt where the Planck scale is 10 to the 18 plus 9 electron volt to the one third. And if we're able to count, or if we're able to count, this should give us roughly 10 to the minus 13 electron volts. So this is tiny. Once again, it requires a very small scale for the scale of this interaction operator here. So that means that this operator here becomes important at an extremely low scale. So we're really strongly relying on this operator to play the role of uh, dark energy. Um, and that, in, uh, just to give you an idea, in distance scale, correspond to around 1,000 kilometers. So for GR, we, would, we have that the, the strong coupling scale, if it were of GR, is the Planck scale. And so the scale uh, uh, at which the non linearities are important, if we, uh, if we ignore the curvature, but we, we can trust it all the way down to uh, the inverse Planck scale, which is a tiny amount, 10 to the minus 34 centimeter, if I remember correctly. Whereas for these models, modified, uh, well, of a dark energy model at least, we'll see how that connects to modified gravity. Uh, the scale at which non linearities become important are huge. I mean, in distance scale, this is huge. This is astronomical almost. I mean, it's the size of, uh, <laughs> of uh, things on Earth. So, so it's a very, a very different um, scale. The only reason why we are allowing ourselves to do so without being too worried, although we should still be worried, is because there may be some essence in the normalization theorem that doesn't correct uh, this thing in, in here. And once again, the level of tuning that we have here, so there's an unfortunate uh, notation accident here that lambda is the scale, is not the cosmological constant. Uh, so let me call lambda cc the cosmological constant. So lambda cc is different than lambda. This is the cosmological constant. And this is the scale of the interactions. In this model, we don't have a cosmological constant. We have that uh, dark energy fluid instead. We have set the cosmological constant. But if we want to see the level of tuning that we have on this scale lambda as compared to the Planck scale, let me put it in cube in here just to simplify my life, we have something that goes like h0 squared of a m Planck squared, and that's precisely the level of tuning we were worried originally. 
This is precisely the level of tuning we are, wor we are worried for the original cos cosmological constant problem. This is the same level of tuning we are worried about for the mass of uh, dark energy fluid, quintessence uh, fluid. Here, it doesn't have a mass in this formulation, but we see that we still involve a scale in the game so that if we, if we want dark energy at the right scale to come out at the end of the day, the scale of the interaction has to be tuned to the same amount. There's no, there's no winning this game without putting uh, a small scale somewhere. Um, and at this level, we haven't solved the cosmic constant problem in the, in the first place. So <laughs> we have the original problem of setting this value to zero, and then we involve a new scale, which has the same tuning as what we had originally. The only hope you may have in playing this game is saying that maybe it's more stable to cons consider a, con uh, a scenario where this tuning could happen and not be as um, unstable under quantum corrections as compared to simply setting the cosmic constant to zero. As we've seen, when you look at radiative corrections to the cosmic constant, um, they are, they are of order of the mass of other particles, whereas you expect here to be protected with some form of uh, normalization theorem. Okay, so that's how um, potential late-time acceleration solutions could um, emerge from this type of solutions. Now, let's, let's as, as we mentioned, if you have a scalar field living in our space-time, driving the acceleration of the universe, we would expect this scalar field to also couple to matter, so also couple to the stress energy tensor of the uh, standard model field that lives in, uh, in our universe, and therefore not to be ruled out by fifth, fourth, fifth forces experiments, we, will need, we need a screening mechanism to occur. And in this type of models, the screening mechanism involved is the Weinstein mechanism or kinetic screening mechanism. And then we'll see how that appears automatically in this type of models. So let's put aside the um, FRW solution or example situ solution that we looked at um, just now. Let's simply look now for the sake of, sake of simplicity at the simple scalar field model with its coupling to, um, to matter. And we know what the GR component is doing. We know the force mediated by GR, so by the tensor mode, so we don't need to worry too much about that now. We just want to look at the additional component that comes in from this color field when coupling to matter. And so we can do that in flat space time. We don't really need to look into the, the fact that the metric may be Schwarzschild or something like that. So the configuration we're gonna put uh, for ourselves it, just to be able to understand a little bit what's going on, is that of a static and spherically symmetric configuration, because that's where the Weinstein mechanism is the best understood. Um, so we're going to consider to have a source, T, which is a mass at the center um, of, uh, at the center of uh, a space-time. So let me imagine we have a mass here, localized at the center, so where this goes like M of M Planck, and then delta three of R. We're gonna be working in uh, spherical coordinates. We have a spherical symmetry, and then we want to see how that scalar field behaves as a function of R. So we have phi as a function of R to start with. And then we'll do perturbations on top of that, but let's have a look at that. If we had none of the Galilean interactions, so if we just had L is minus a half d phi squared, plus directly the coupling between phi and t over the Planck scale. And we consider a source which is a localized mass, so for instance the sun, it could be the mass of the sun in here, localized at the origin of our spherical coordinates. What would be the form of the force mediated by that scalar field? That would be what we have usually in Newton and gravity. And so we will recover something that goes like the Newton square law. We we'll go like one over R squared. We would have the mass and we would have the Planck scale in here. We'll need to behave roughly like that. 
Okay? I have to have a factor in here that I don't know exactly what it is. You could see that by putting it explicitly. We're going to see that in a more general case, so I'm not going to do it just there. We're just going to look at the more general case. Okay? So if we had that, we would see that uh, this additional scalar field would mediate an additional force on top of what gravity, GR, usually do, and that would be clearly ruled out by observations, okay? So now what we're going to consider is a case where we potentially may have screening. We're going to see how we have uh, screening. So that would be Newton square law. But it's an additional one. So if we're working in the Newtonian approximation, you would have an order one correction to what we have in the, in the Newtonian force. So instead, the whole point of this interaction is that they can lead to some screening. So instead, we're going to consider the case where we have, for instance, just the cubic Galilean. It's much easier if I just focus on the cubic Galilean and then as an exercise, you can do it with uh, the other ones if you wanted to. Um, okay, so we can do that uh, assuming in spherical symmetry. So you have that, and then you have the coupling to matter. So phi of m like t, and t is minus m, the mass of the center of our space-time, and then delta r of r squared. So I'll let you derive explicitly what the equation of motions um, are. When you do so, don't forget that you're working in spherical coordinates, so you're going to have to need to put the measure back in it. Okay? Um, so you'll have this R square here and this R square there. And then here it looks like you would have double uh, derivative with respect to uh, R for phi, but as we said before, we can integrate those by parts. Okay, this, roughly speaking, looks like phi prime squared and then phi double prime, and you have other terms, but this, you can rewrite it as phi prime cube. Okay? So you can derive your equation of motion with respect to phi in here. And what you get is something that looks like phi prime over r plus 1 over lambda cube, phi prime over R squared is equal to M over M Planck. Uh, in deriving this equation, there's a derivative with respect to R, and then there's a delta function. In, well, let, me, let me write it. We'll have something like that. There's an R squared in here from the measure. And then there is a delta. Uh, delta R. That's a two, two, two. I think there's an R cube even. Okay, so you can perform, this is some type of Birkhoff theorem that you have for this particular um, solution. It's not true in general. And so if you integrate by parts, uh, sorry, if you integrate on both sides, you integrate here and you get rid of the delta function in there, what you get is that your equation of motion for phi is 1 over lambda cube phi prime over r squared is equal to m, the mass of the Planck scale, and then 1 over r cube. And there may be factors of uh, 4 pi from the measure of the delta function, which are going to ignore for now, right? We're just looking at things symbolically. So hopefully this is right. And so we can see from this equation two types of behaviors depending on which term on the left-hand side dominates, which term is the most important. So if we are at very large distances, I'm going to define what I mean by the very large distances in a second. But if we are going to infinity, then clearly this thing 
is very small, right? And so we don't expect phi prime to be very large. And then therefore, since phi prime is quite small, this thing is negligible as compared to that one. So if R is large enough, And I define what I mean by large enough, but larger than some given value, or star, which we will define in a second, then this should be small. So if then phi prime over r, one over lambda cube, should be uh, small. And then I'm just, the left-hand side is dominated by the first linear term, and we recover something like the Newton square law, where phi prime goes like m over m Planck, one over r squared. There's factors of two pi's, et cetera, that which I haven't put it in, but this is just to give you an impression. So we recover the standard Newton uh, square law behavior at large distances, and this is what happens in the weak field approximation, okay? So then we have order one corrections to uh, GR gravity. Because this is in addition to the standard, um, Newton, to the standard Newton force. Okay, so if that was the end of the story, and if this behavior was true all the way from infinity down to very close to the mass of what's at the origin of your space time, then we would be clearly ruled out by um, test of gravity. However, we see that um, at smaller distances, and now we can define what we mean by smaller distances. At smaller distances is when this is not uh, much smaller than one, but instead much larger than one. And now we can take this behavior as a first approximation to define what we mean by smaller distances. So there's an, let me, okay, let me just say there's an intermediate scale. So an intermediate scale. Where both this term and that term are of the same order of magnitude. That happens when this is of order one. So when phi prime over r is of order lambda cube. And so to see when that scale happens, we can plug in here, we can plug in here the expression for phi q, for phi prime, and that tells us that this is at a radius which goes like m over m Planck as to the cube is of order lambda cube, and let me call it r star. So R star goes one, like one over lambda, and then M over M Planck to the one third. So when we go from infinity, a very large R, we have something that looks like a Newton square law mediated by the new degree of freedom, all the way up till we hit a radius R star, which is inversely proportional to this uh, strong coupling scale. So we see that um, the smallest this strong complex scale is, the quickest coming from infinity are we going to hit that new regime, okay? And the biggest the mass is, the quickest coming from infinity as well, we're going to hit the new regime. So we're going to have a more efficient uh, Weinstein mechanism, as we will see. If we have a smaller scale lambda, or if we have a bigger mass. So if we have uh, just the sun, as opposed to if you account for all the mass present in the galaxy, then it will give you um, slightly different, or slightly more efficient uh, Weinstein behavior. Okay, so this is the intermediate scale, and now we can define what we mean by short distances as compared to that. Uh, as you enter what we call the strong coupling radius, or the Weinstein radius, you 
you'll see this being called as well the Weinstein radius. That is uh, distances. This equation is satisfied with the left-hand side being dominated by the interacting term, by um, the, the, um, the second term, and we have an equation rather that goes like phi prime of R squared goes like lambda cube M of M Planck and then one over R squared, right? And uh, no, one over R cube. Yeah, one over R cube. So we see that phi prime now no longer scales like one over R squared, but will scale like one over R to the one half. And then the rest is, uh, you have to, <laughs> you can complete the rest with the units. It will need to go like M of M Planck, a half, and then it will need to go like lambda to the three half. This is roughly speaking. And so if you look at the force mediated by this kind of field, I'm going to multiply it by R squared so that I can compare with what I would have had if we are in the Newton square, square law. So let me say it's R squared. I'm going to divide by the whole thing. They would be. And then M Planck times M Planck over M. So what happens at large distances is something which is of order one for this quantity. Of order, so it's our order one correction as compared to what we have in GR at large distances. But as we uh, reach a strong coupling radius R star, which is determined by the scale lambda and by the mass of the object we're considering, so it's, uh, it's depending on the environment again, it's depending on explicit configuration we're looking at, then we'll see that phi prime, uh, R squared phi prime, in this case, goes like R to the 3 half. Yeah? So this, as compared to what we would have had for Newton square law, goes to zero. So R squared phi prime here goes like R to the 3 half, Whereas here, R squared phi prime goes like one. So this means there's an order one corrections to gravity on distance scales larger than the strong coupling radius, whereas there's a suppressed correction to gravity on shorter distances. And, and this behavior, this transition between that uh, order one effect to a suppressed effect is precisely the, what is called the Weinstein radius, the Weinstein screening mechanism. So if you wanted to, then you could see uh, more precisely what the effect of such a force would be in the solar system. And if you look for just this cubic Galilean case, um, different constraints that you have from purpose of gravity in the solar system, um, there's actually the strongest one for, for this type of consideration is the one coming from lunar laser ranging experiment. So apparently, Americans said they've been on the moon uh, and they put a mirror on the moon from the Apollo mission. From this mirror on the moon, um, we can shoot a laser from the Earth to the moon and have a very good accuracy of the motion of the moon around the Earth and determine the advance of the perihelion of the moon um, along its different orbits. And, and we can compare with uh, what it should be in GR, or what it should be in this case. Um, and the fact that uh, the angle of the, the position of the moon around the Earth um, is now measured with a precision of 10 to the minus 11 and is in complete agreement with what we would have had just from the force of gravity without an additional fifth force, that can help us put a constraint um, on the parameters of such a theory. So then we would take the mass really becoming from the mass of the Earth in this system, and we say that even if you have a tiny difference in here um, coming from this force, it's still sufficient to put constraint on this type of models. And having um, a correction from this force, which should be 
less than 1 in 10 to the 11, because this is a precision of the angle, tell us that the scale lambda has to be smaller, roughly, than 10 to the minus 13 electron volt. That's interesting, no? I found that very interesting. This is actually precisely the scale we needed to, for these models to um, explain dark energy. This is a pure coincidence. It's roughly of that, maybe it's, uh, it's not quite 13, maybe it's 12, but it's really very much on the edge for this cubic Galileon, precisely cubic and Galileo interaction. It will be slightly different if you added uh, the quartic Galileon, et cetera, but not dramatically different. Maybe a few, one or two orders of magnitude, but not dramatically different. So this is really one, <laughs> this tells you that uh, having uh, this type of model could in principle just be on the edge of um, giving you dark energy solution with a scale that would still be consistent with solar system constraints. Now, it does happen for that for this cubic Galilean, actually from other observation cosmological constraint, this is actually ruled out, uh, just having this cubic Galilean. Uh, but People are now trying with uh, different other type of models, and I'll discuss a little bit uh, more about that. But I want to, to, to go a little bit more in detail about um, Weinstein screening, because it's a little bit more than just, uh, just that. Now, if we consider this solution as the background solution, so we have a large uh, mass at the center of the system that we want to consider, and then we want to look at um, a probe system on top of that. So let's imagine we have a large mass, which is the sun, for instance, and then we are here in the middle of space and we have two test bodies uh, and we want to check what the force between these two test bodies are. In the vicinity of a large mass, that means that the background is Einstein screen. We have a large background configuration for pi, uh, sorry, for phi here, for the scalar field phi, and then we like to look at how fluctuations, how we're going to have a, a small force between two test uh, bodies on top of this configuration. So the situation we're considering is the scalar field phi has the background value, which is the solution we have just found, for instance, or you may want to consider more complicated configurations where it may be a little bit more complicated. Um, and then you have fluctuations on top of that. So this is sourced by a large mass, a large stress and a trace of a stress energy intensity. And then once we solve for that, we know exactly the solution of that. We want to look at corrections or small fluctuations on top of that, small perturbations on top of that, that are sourced by a small test uh, contribution, uh, a, a small test source. So that's the situation we want to explore. And so we can do perturbations on top of our solutions. And this, when, when you do perturbations, it's always best to do it at the level of the Lagrangian or the action because it really, first of all, it allows you to determine stability. Things like ghosts, it's very, it's much harder to find um, this criteria, if you just focus on the equation of motion, because um, you can multiply the equation of motion by minus, you wouldn't see the difference. But at the level of the action, it's much more uh, clear. Uh, but also, the level of skills is much clearer to understand what's going on if you're working at the level of the action. So, we have d for x. Let me just rewrite for a second the configuration we're looking at. So, we're looking at a cubic Galileo theory. Again, just for simplicity, this is ruled out by observations, but let me just, for simplicity, give you the essence of the Weinstein mechanism. And so T, let me say this is T bar. T will have a contribution from T bar and delta T, and then phi has a contribution from phi bar and delta phi. So I do fluctuations on top of that, and I'm using the fact that the background satisfies the equation of motion for the source T bar, so I'm not gonna follow the terms that are just linear in delta phi, because this would be zero for my equations of motion. And so we, what we have by performing fluctuations is something that goes like that. Let me write that in different color.
going to tell you in a second what this effective inverse metric is. And we have the interaction that we wrote down, and then we have the coupling to our perturbed uh, source. So I haven't told you what uh, Z was. It looks like an effective inverse metric on which the fluctuations are living in. Uh, but clearly, this Z should depend on the background. So if we didn't have this interaction here, this Z would just be Tamunu, right? At this level, we have ignored the gravity. Uh, <laughs> we're just focusing on this part of gravity, if you want to think of it like that. Um, so if we didn't have that term, this z mu nu would just be eta mu nu, right? This is eta mu nu, d mu phi, d nu phi, uh, delta phi, delta phi. Well, actually, this is um, d mu phi, d nu phi. But now, from this part in here, we're clearly going to have something that goes like box phi background eta mu nu for the fluctuations, and then there's also a case where this is part of the fluctuation, one of the phi here is part of the fluctuations, and then the other one is part of the background. And then to, to express it like that, I need to do an integration by parts. And so uh, the derivative of the one that came for the fluctuation will need to act back onto the one for the background, so we'll have two derivatives acting on the background. So putting all of that into account, what we end up having is something like that which would be the end of the story if we didn't have the cubic Galilean interactions. But then we have corrections that have to come from lambda cube. And I said that they have to be second derivatives acting on the background. And they happen to be box phi background minus, uh, sorry, eta mu nu, minus d mu d nu phi background. It may not be automatically obvious that this is what it is. But um, it has to be the case that this quantity here has to be, um, yeah, it has to be, <laughs> it has to be that. So you can derive that explicitly. Uh, the easiest probably is to put that back into an epsilon structure, and you will see that it's, it is exactly, exactly that. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time doing that. So this is the affective metric that the fluctuations are living in. But now what we've seen is that if you had very large distances, then um, you are the, you're in the weak field approximation, and then your four will be dominated by the standard uh, eta mu nu, and we'll see the standard cubic Galileon very far away. And that makes sense, because if you're very far away from your background source, then you shouldn't be sensitive to what, what was going on at the origin, right? If, if you are, then you're doing something wrong. Very far away, you should be quite insensitive of that. But as you go closer and closer to your original background source in here, then you start becoming more and more sensitive to that, and these terms are the one that dominates. And as we go closer and closer, we said, we, we, we've seen that it means, I erased it, but it meant that phi prime over R was much larger than lambda cube. So then this thing here starts becoming much larger than one. So as R is much larger than R star, you have Z mu nu is simply eta mu nu. But as R, you start entering the strong coupling radius, so the Weinstein radius, then Z mu nu is dominated by the interactions, and it's something that goes like two derivatives acting on phi background of a lambda cube. The two derivatives acting on phi background of a lambda cube, this is roughly speaking one over R phi prime of a lambda cube, roughly speaking. And so this is roughly, uh, you can put back your solution 
uh, from here. And you'll have something that goes like one over r to the three half, and then the rest is uh, to the three half m over m Planck to the half. So z, the eigenvalues of z, roughly speaking, are much larger than one if lambda is very small, uh, some scale, uh, Planck, but uh, don't really mean n Planck. So the smallest the strong coupling scale is, the more efficient the function radio, uh, function mechanism will be, uh, or if the mass is very large. And so if this starting to become quite different from order one, then what we really need to do is kind of canonically normalize our field. So to do that explicitly when uh, this z mu nu is not diagonal, is, uh, is uh, entirely doable, but it's not something I want to spend an hour on. So let's just, you can diagonalize, you can change your coordinate, diagonalize your, your effective metric, and then uh, just, uh, make it uh, um, absorb the eigenvalues in the scalar field phi. So, but I'm just going to do it symbolically, you know, define a new canonically normalized scalar field with, roughly speaking, this goes like the square root of z, where what we mean here are the eigenvalues, the typical eigenvalues that come in into this effective metric z, delta phi. So now I'm working, let's, let's just imagine that we're in a scenario where z mu nu is roughly speaking going like z eta mu nu. That's not quite the case, but let's imagine just for, to understand what's going on, let's imagine we could do that. Really what we should put there is the eigenvalues, but it doesn't matter too, too much. When we do that and we plug that back into our action, what we get is for the normalized scalar field is something that is now normalized, just like what we wanted. And then this is the essence of the Wanstein mechanism that I mentioned yesterday. What we get for the interactions is that what they see on this and this background is no longer a scale z, a, a, a scale lambda, but a redress scale lambda square root z. And then the coupling to matter is no longer at the Planck scale, but actually at a much larger scale um, carried by m Planck times square root z. So we end up with a new strong coupling scale. This is the redressed scale, lambda star, which is of the order of lambda square root z. And a new coupling to, scale, coupling to matter scale or the coupling to matter, let me just say, the coupling to matter is suppressed by one over square root z, as compared to Durand. In the um, situation that I considered before, if you just consider the mass of the the Earth, and then if you consider the scale lambda, as I mentioned before, to be a thousand kilometers minus one, so 10 to the minus 13 electron volt, and you put these numbers back in, what you get is Z of the order of 10 to the uh, 16, so it's huge, 
in that regime when, uh, when you're close to the, when you're on the surface of the Earth. That's on the surface of the Earth. That's huge. And the associated lambda star is um, of roughly of the order of a centimeter. So you manage to uh, increase your strong coupling scale, which is a, a good thing. And when you start doing perturbations on top of that background, you don't need to worry about these interactions until you get to much shorter distances. And that's better because you want to be able to do things at the linear level for as long as possible once you have accounted for this Einstein screening. And so you see that the coupling to matter of these perturbations on top of that background is very suppressed now as compared to what you have uh, for the standard Newton square area. And so that's how you can avoid fifth um, forces experiments. Uh, I have 15 minutes, is that? Say it again? I can't hear. Yes, these are perturbations, yeah. Now, the, this is, this is, I can say this is the, this is the leading, and this is what would be the linear order at the level of the equation of motion, and this is the quadratic order at the level of the equation of motion. So this corresponds to linear perturbations, if you will, yeah. So it's okay to be working with linear perturbations. Okay, so this is the essence of the Vanstein mechanism. Uh, we looked at different type of screening mechanism between the chameleon one, which leads to the um, mass um, being environment dependent, and, be, and so the field becoming massive and effectively um, suppressing the force it can mediate in dense environments uh, to this function mechanism to also weak coupling. Someone asked a very interesting question yesterday on whether we can put all of this, well, not, the question was much better formulated than that, but let me just say, well, can we try to combine these different mechanisms with one another so that they, they all come in and join forces? I mean, that sounds, that's, <laughs> that sounds good. And it's interesting because this function on the mechanism is actually working in the other way as the, t the other two. The weak coupling to gravity, oh, sorry, the weak coupling to matter, or the, the chameleon mechanism. In the sense that you actually need this contribution from the mass to be very large, to redress the background, to have the fluctuations on top of them being very small. So if you start making this very small for the, the whole covariant uh, formulation, then you're not gonna have a Vanstein mechanism. And this Vanstein mechanism, we see that any of the interactions it makes it uh, suppressed as compared to uh, the, the normal kinetic term. In particular, if we had had a mass, uh, if I had added a mass here for the scalar field, d phi squared, and then we see that it, when I canonically normalize it, I'll have a z coming in here, and so it suppresses the effective mass of the scalar field as well. So it's working in the absolutely opposite direction as the chameleon mechanism. So it's actually not something that you can do very easily of having both a chameleon mechanism and a Weinstein mechanism at the same time, okay? Okay, so uh, I have 15 minutes to tell you all about modified gravity, um, which I clearly not gonna do. So um, let me just give you uh, a few motivations, okay? So first of all, when we're talking about modified gravity here, this is not smond. It's modified gravity for dark energy. And it's a modification of gravity at very large cosmological distances to help us with the cosmological constant problem possibly, or with uh, dark energy as a source for dark energy. And there's all these realm of possibilities where you could have self-acceleration, where the acceleration of the universe is not coming from an external black fluid, but the degrees of freedom leading to the acceleration of the universe are intrinsic to the graviton itself. That's the idea behind um, self-acceleration. Gravity just wants to accelerate by itself for a reason 
or another. Possibly uh, from the fact that it has so many ZD zero modes that want to condensate itself and lead to the acceleration of the universe. If we're considering modifications, modifications of gravity at large distances, so in the infrared, so we now need to consider the inclusions of operators which are infrared operators as compared to um, the standard one, the standard Einstein-Hilbert one. So it, this direction has absolutely nothing to do with trying to have a renormalized theory of gravity, of UV completing gravity, including operators that come in at the Planck scale. It's the opposite side of the spectrum. You're really trying to see what's going on. Uh, cosmological scales, so it's infrared corrections. So you want to include, very naively, you want to include new operators in your action for gravity, which are going to be the ones relevant at very low energy. So you would want to include something which has fewer derivatives than the einstein hilbert term. So of course you can include a cosmological constant, uh, uh, but that's not really what we mean by modified gravity, and then and that's it. And covariantly, this, this is it. You can't really include any anything else if you do really do want to modify gravity. You can say, well, I'm going to include functions of that, the scalar curvature, and we talked about that, and that's, re that's really gravity in a scalar field, and it's not really modifying gravity in infrared in this sense. So it's been shown in some very nice papers that um, any effective description of gravity in infrared will ultimately need to effectively look like the graviton has a mass at large distances. It can be an effective mass, it can be a resonance, it can be a local or non-local mass, but effectively it needs to be an operator that looks like a mass. And this is, I mean, let me just think of a, a scalar field. That's trivial if you think of a scalar field, right? If you want to have something local for a scalar field, let me say I have this scalar field being sourced like that. If I want to modify the behavior of this scalar field in infrared, uh, the only thing I can do is add a mass here, okay? So if we want to add, modify the behavior of gravity in infrared, effectively, we will need to include something that looks like uh, a mass term. Yeah, this is non-local. So if I want to have something local, I need to consider a mass, but indeed. And, what you're talking about, you can uh, put them into an effective mass. And then it's a non-local effective mass. Yeah. And you can consider them as being part of a resonance. So you could have, indeed, something that would look like fewer number of derivatives by taming the number of derivatives as a log, uh, like you said, precisely. And effectively, that would look like a mass, uh, a non-local mass, but a mass term non nonetheless. Yeah. So it, this can be function of box in such a way that this is the one that dominates when you send uh, the derivatives to zero at very low uh, momentum, indeed. So um, it doesn't, this doesn't need to be necessarily a constant, but it's some type of, uh, of mass term. Now you know, let me say uh, two statements that may seem disconnected. So if you have a GR, which is the th Interacting theory of a massless spin to field. So the fundamental object are gravitational waves, which have two uh, polarizations. And we have two degrees of freedom, which I'm going to call them plus or minus two in 40. I'm working in 40. If you want an effective local or not resonance or not mass, massive uh, spin to field, then in 4D, it will have five excitations, a spin S in 4D, if it's massive, has 2s plus 1 uh, excitations, or degrees of freedom. So in 4D, for a spin 2, that corresponds to 5 degrees of freedom. And those corresponds to 
the same two as we had for GR, for the massless case. And then you have plus or minus one excitations, and then you have uh, helicity zero or excitation. These are helicity, I can see, think of them as helicity modes, of course, and in the massive case, but let me just think of them as, as helicity modes. Um, they are helicity modes in a special limit um, of the theory when you kind of decouple the behavior of the, the nonlinearities of gravity, you recover some notion of um, Lorentz invariance, and you can, you can think of these modes as scalar vector tensor in some particular limit of the theory. And so this additional mode for cosmological purposes will look like a scalar mode. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. No, okay, but not as good, okay. So this will behave as a, a Galilean, end of story. <laughs> Uh, in some uh, limit, this behaves as a Galilean, and this behaves as vector fields in some limits, um, and they don't really couple to matter. Let me just say in half a second, and then I'll show you a slide, the intuition of why this behaves as a Galilean, and so why this whole story about the Galilean that I talked about may be relevant for models of modified gravity. So if you want to add a mass term here, it's not going to be a cosmological constant. It's going to effectively break for the diff invariance. So if I, if, I, the most, if I have a scalar field, what I mean by adding a mass for the scalar field is adding a phi squared uh, in, at the level of my Lagrangian. For, the, for gravity, for, sorry, for a spin to field, I would like to add something which goes like the metric square, but this anything which is covariant, this would, this would just give me a number, right, or, or a cosmological constant. So what we need to do is really consider the spin to field at a, a more, back to our, the roots, we're going to consider fluctuations around flat space time, and what we mean by adding a mass term is really a mass term for these fluctuations around flat space time. So the mass term is always, uh, going roughly like h squared. Doesn't matter too much what the form of this h squared is, so you have h squared, you have h mu squared, or something like that, but what does matter is that this thing here is actually uh, the square of the difference between your dynamical metric and your Minkowski metric. So it's g mu nu minus eta mu nu squared. And by that you want to put at the level of your action, and this is coordinate transformation, uh, this transforms as a tensor under coordinate transformations, trivial as so, but this does not transform properly. These are not transform at all under coordinate transformations, and so if you just wrote it like that, this would not be coordinate transformation invariant. So in writing the mass term kind of in this form, you're really working in a preferred frame. And so you can restore your coordinate transformation invariant by promoting this object to a tensor, you're going to promote it to a tensor by writing it as the flat Minkowski metric and then introducing four what, is, what I call Stuckerberg scalar fields. So phi A's are four Stuckerberg Scalar fields. They transform a scalar field and a coordinate transformation. In, and so that this whole thing, this eta tilde mu nu, transform as a tensor. And so if I put a tilde down here, hey, this transforms as a tensor, and I have restored my coordinate transformation in balance. Now, um, I can go back to the preferred frame that we had before by setting simply this scalar field to be xa. This is what is called unitary gauge. But for a second, it may be useful to split it, to keep the excitations that live into phi A, write them like that as something that would look like a vector field in some limit, and something that would look like a scalar field in some limit. Okay, let me just write it like that. And so the way they come in into eta mu nu, let me set that to zero. Uh, 
I set it by hand for now, just to focus on the point. It's not that it's zero, it's just, uh, it's too complicated for me. Um, so then eta tilde mu nu, in that case, is eta mu nu plus two d mu d nu phi plus d mu d nu phi squared. So now we see that built in into this mass term, into this uh, Lagrangian for your modified theory of gravity, no matter precisely what it is, no matter whether this is um, local or non-local, uh, uh, a real hard mass or a soft mass, a resonance, it doesn't matter too much, this whole story will go through. And we see that for that field that behaves as a scalar field in some limit, the Galileon and shift symmetry is built in. So this scalar field, phi, the way it enters, phi satisfies, or the, the whole uh, theory satisfies a shift in Galilean symmetry. And so, if you want your theory to be ghost-free, not to have be plagued by the higher derivative terms, it has to be the case that the Galilean type of interactions that I wrote down yesterday and that we use today have to emerge from your theories of modified gravity in infrared, no matter what you do. So this is the connection between Galileans and uh, yeah. modified gravity. Okay. Yes? What about uh, adding, like, uh, restarting at 2? So ah, but I'm, I'm at the airport. Ah, but you're already here. Sorry, because there are people at uh, Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. okay, okay. Can I... Uh, let me just show you, ah, sorry. Um, so, I'll post that online. Uh, it's just to give you some motivation on having a look at it. <clears throat> I wrote down, can you see? It's a bit, uh, light, uh, uh, not so very bright. So, uh, you probably can't see it. Huh? Um, I, I showed for you a, diff a diagram of how these different things uh, matching together between modifications of gravity to Galileans, to Handesky theories, to beyond Handesky theories, uh, to beyond beyond Handesky theories, to generalized Proca theories, to generalized non-abelians, to multigravity, et cetera, how all of these things fit in together and how the mansion mechanism works for most of these uh, different things. So even if you're working for a generalized Proca theory, which is really a vector field, um, it will have, and dark energy will really uh, be somehow linked to the helicity zero mode that comes into this theory, and you'll have a mansion mechanism that protects you, hopefully, within some, uh, um, some regions, uh, at least some dense regions. And then there's been some uh, recent uh, detection of gravitational waves that allows you to um, determine the speed of gravitational waves as compared to that of light. And that has ruled out many of this model. Ask Paolo uh, for more details for that. So it's, it's quite kind of nice how in this whole spectrum now from correct observations, you have uh, many of these models here that are rolled out. They're no longer viable candidates for dark energy. So it's not only that we're populating our whole uh, spectrum with new ideas without any ways to probe them. There, there's, uh, it's, it's quite nice how we've been able, or some people have been able to um, discriminate between them. And then there's a whole way to um, observe them which I don't have time to uh, go through it. Okay, thank you.